Hello and greetings from beautiful Santa Barbara. Well, actually today we've got a little June gloom, but I'll take it. Are you named after anyone? On Memorial Day in the 1025 Elmo Connection, I told you about the two men in my family that I'm named after. My middle name, Vincent, comes from my maternal grandfather, Vincent Francis Walling. Sadly, Vincent died before I had a chance to meet him, but I grew up hearing my mom tell stories about her dad and how much he loved his two daughters and his wife. And he loved to laugh. He was a joyful man. My first name, Thomas, comes from my great uncle, Cecil Thomas Haugen. I grew up hearing stories about my great uncle, who everyone called Tommy. Tommy joined the Army Air Corps after graduating from the University of Wisconsin in 1941. He served with the U.S. Army Air Corps 7th Photographic Reconnaissance Squadron stationed in Mount Farm, Oxfordshire, England during World War II. Tommy bravely piloted both the Lockheed P-38 Lightning and the Supermarine Spitfire. His planes didn't have any guns, only cameras, and a slight speed advantage to protect him from the German Luftwaffe. He flew over France and Germany to gather intelligence photographs. Those brave pilots took pictures from the air to identify strategic targets, track troop movements, and help bring an end to the war. Military historians believe that these pilots, armed only with a camera, helped to win more battles and saved more lives than any other piece of equipment during World War II. Major Cecil Thomas Haugen was killed in action on June 28, 1944, two weeks after D-Day. Tommy was flying back from his uh, mission in Germany back into England when his Spitfire encountered bad weather and crashed. Tommy was only 24 years old when he died. I have the letter from Tommy's military chaplain that was sent to my great-grandfather after his son's death. In that letter, it's obvious that Tommy was a good commanding officer and that he loved Jesus and he loved people deeply. I thank God for Tommy and his sacrifice and his legacy. Growing up, my dad would tell me stories about Tommy. Tommy became my hero. He is my hero, and my admiration for him grows every day. I remember as a child thinking, I need to live up to the hero that I'm named after. Who are your heroes? One of my spiritual heroes is Scottish pastor Oswald Chambers, who lived in the late 1800s and early 1900s. I was so impacted by the writings of Oswald Chambers in the first few years after becoming a Christian that when I had the opportunity, I went to the University of Edinburgh after finishing my Master of Divinity to work on a THM. Through Oswald Chambers' written sermons, he mentored me, encouraged me, and challenged me in my Christian faith. Primarily, Oswald taught me the importance of giving everything to Jesus. Oswald lived a life radically surrendered to Jesus Christ. If you read Oswald Chambers' writings, you'll often encounter a phrase that describes his life well, abandoned to God. Oswald Chambers lived a life abandoned to God, and he encouraged others to do the same. When Oswald Chambers was at the University of Edinburgh, he was called into vocational ministry. Oswald was a talented artist who loved to paint and write poetry. Then one autumn night, he grabbed his wool blanket and climbed to the top of Arthur's seat overlooking Edinburgh, Scotland. There on Arthur's seat, Oswald wrestled with God all night in prayer, asking God to make his will clear to him. In the middle of the night, Oswald Chambers described hearing God speak these words to him. I want you in my service, but I can do without you. I imagine God probably had a Scottish accent when he said that to Oswald. 
On that cold night in Scotland, on the top of Arthur's seat, Oswald Chambers gave his whole life to serving the Lord. At that moment, he decided to follow Christ with reckless abandon, no matter what the cost. During World War I, Oswald Chambers served as a chaplain to soldiers through the YMCA. On November 15, 1917, Oswald Chambers died from complications following an emergency appendectomy. He was buried in Cairo with full military honors. Since his death in 1917, millions have read the words Oswald Chambers wrote because of his wife, Biddy Chambers, who took meticulous shorthand notes of every one of his sermons, and then she compiled him them in a book after his death. We know that book as those 365 daily devotionals called My Utmost for His Highest. Who are your heroes? I admire my great uncle Tommy and Oswald Chambers because they both had grit. Yes, grit. In April 2013, Dr. Angela Lee Duckworth, professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, gave a TED Talk briefly describing her many years of research. Her TED Talk, entitled Grit, The Power and Passion of Perseverance, has received almost 13 million views since it was posted. I encourage you to watch it sometime. After years of research and observing students at West Point and other schools, it turns out across all socioeconomic, educational, psychological demographics, one characteristic consistently emerges as a significant predictor of success grit. Duckworth defines grit as the ability to persevere in pursuing a future goal over a long period of time and not giving up. It's having stamina. It's sticking with your future day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living like life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. Grit is passion and perseverance for a very long-term goal. Grit is a significant predictor of success in the world, but more importantly, I believe grit is essential for thriving in our walk with Christ, for thriving in our Christian faith. If we want to grow in our Christian faith, we need to cultivate godly grit. We won't find grit in most of the English translations of our Bible, but the Bible's term for grit, steadfastness, and endurance is found throughout scriptures. Godly grit is trusting Christ day in and day out for the long haul, no matter what challenges we might face. The Bible is full of people who are examples of godly grit. Just look at the Old Testament. There was Abraham and Joseph and Moses, Leah, Jacob, Joseph, David, and Esther. Naomi, Ruth, Elijah, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, just to name a few. Yes, these men and women had flaws for sure, but they still kept running back to God and using, letting God use them for his glory. Empowered by a deep and abiding trust in God, these men and women of the Old Testament demonstrated resilience in the face of challenges and adversity. Their stories teach us about passion and perseverance and endurance and stamina. These stories teach us all about godly grit. That all-in determination to keep our eyes on Jesus and endure for the long haul no matter what challenges we might face. We're learning a thing or two about godly grit these days in our country, divided by racism and rocked by the COVID-19 pandemic. As followers of Christ, yes, we are truly standing on the shoulders of giants. Faithful women and men who have gone before us, courageously following God. Through the endurance taught in Scripture and the encouragement they provide, you and I have hope. Today, we're going to look at one of my favorite gritty men in the Old Testament, Elisha. Elisha had an amazing ministry. He was the miracle prophet. In fact, there are more miracles attributed to Elisha than any other person in the Bible except for Jesus. Elisha brought a boy back from the dead. 
He turned a little bit of oil into a lot of oil and kept a widow from going into debt and having to sell her two children into slavery. He changed poison stew into good stew. Few, uh, he took a few hundred, um, he fed a few hundred men with 20 barley loaves and a few ears of corn. He healed Naaman of leprosy and in a very cool and gritty uh, miracle, he actually made an iron axe head float on water. But Elisha's ministry wasn't all miracles. His ministry was also really challenging. There was that whole incident with the young boys yelling at him, hey, go on up, you old bald head. And the two she-bears that came out of the woods to teach those 42 boys a lesson they would never forget. There was Baal worship on every corner of Israel, which created a lot of stress for God's prophets. There was King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who wanted all God's prophets dead, including Elisha and Elijah, and they even put a substantial price on those men's heads. There were battles and conflicts and many moments for life and death decisions to be made in Elisha's ministry. And there was the departure of his much-loved mentor, Elijah, in a fiery chariot. Elisha was able to persevere for the long haul. He had godly grit because he was courageous enough to follow God one step at a time, wherever it might take him. Elisha is one of my heroes in the scripture, and I really appreciate how his ministry began. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 to 20, Elijah is coming to the end of his ministry, and he's looking for a replacement. Older Elijah has faithfully served the Lord as the prophet in Israel for many years, and he's had an incredible life. There was that contest with the 850 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Do you remember that? At 850 to 1, the odds were not in Elijah's favor, but Elijah had God on his side. The 850 prophets of Baal couldn't get a fire started even with dry wood after a drought but Elijah pours water on the wood and then calls down fire from heaven. The fire is so intense, it burns up the animal sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dirt, and even the water in the trench. After this victory, God dramatically reveals his presence to Elijah. There's a powerful wind tearing the mountains and the rocks apart, but the scripture says God is not in the wind. There's an earthquake but God is not in the earthquake. There's fire, but God is not in the fire. God quietly reveals himself to Elijah in a gentle whisper. Then God tells Elijah, it's time to pick a prophet who will continue God's work, Elisha. This is where we find Elijah. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning at verse 19. In here we read, in 1 Kings chapter 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. Then he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again for what I have to done to you. This is a really dramatic moment in scripture and in history. Elijah is an old man standing in a field full of younger men with their teams of oxen. The dust is thick in the air and I imagine it was hard to breathe. And he walks over to Elisha and he wraps his cloak around him. The prophet's cloak is a symbol of his calling as a prophet of God. When he throws his cloak on Elisha, the meaning is clear. Elisha, God has a job for you to do. Leave this field. Let's get going. Elisha has a lot of land. He's got a large staff. He comes from a prosperous family and is very wealthy. He's doing all right for himself, and he has a bright future in agriculture with enormous earning potential. Elisha is being groomed 
to take over the lucrative family business. On this trajectory, Elisha has a pretty comfortable life in front of him. But God has a very different plan for Elisha. I imagine Elijah at this time is a little nervous about Elisha going back to kiss his father and mother goodbye. What if his parents remind him about the secure future in the family business? No way his parents are going to like this whole leaving and going to follow the prophet. The bright future, the company perks, the future grandkids, the 401k. He can't throw it all away and leave everything just to follow Elijah. The account continues in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 21. It says, And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. This is a seriously gritty move. This is a full-on commitment move for God. Elisha didn't suffer from commitment phobia that we often see in our world today and people following Christ. He wasn't hedging his bets. He wasn't negotiating with God. He didn't say, I I'll do it if nothing better comes along. Elisha wasn't keeping his options open. The commitment is made. The costly sacrifice is made. A visible public statement of his commitment is offered to everyone to see, to smell, and to taste. He kills two oxen and makes a fire with the plowing equipment and invites the entire town for an all-you-can-eat oxen feast. Two oxen would provide a lot of meat. Enough for us to have a pretty big tri-tip barbecue at Elmo and invite all of Montecito, I'm pretty confident. This is a seriously gritty move on Elisha's part. It's like Cortez burning his ships when he comes to the new world. There's no turning back for Elisha now. He's burned the plowing equipment. He's killed the oxen. There was no way for Elijah to know everything in front of him at that moment, but he did have the courage to do the next right thing that he knew he ought to do. It's always a good thing to make a public proclamation of a bold decision. It gives us accountability. This is why Christians have wedding ceremonies. This is why followers of Christ have public baptisms and confirmations. When things got tough for Elisha, and, and things always seem to get tough in ministry and in life, he could look back on that bold proclamation and say, there's no turning back. I burned the plow equipment. I ate the oxen. I need to go forward with God. Elijah went on to serve the Lord faithfully with his life. It wasn't an easy life, but I don't think Elisha had any regrets. Elisha served God faithfully with passion and perseverance for the long haul. He lived out some serious godly grit. As I think about Elisha's all-in commitment to leave everything, burning the plowing equipment, grilling the oxen, and throwing a party for the village, I'm inspired. But to be honest, I'm also a bit overwhelmed. I don't know what this type of commitment move looks like today in the 21st century, but it is a bit scary. I know we've all heard sermons with emotionally charged appeals for a 100% commitment to follow Jesus and go in there with reckless abandon. And I do believe that following Jesus is a call to die to ourselves, to live for him completely, nothing held back, no hedging of our bets. But I also know that this kind of burn the plow equipment, kill the oxen move is scary and it can be overwhelming. The huge all-in burn the plow equipment commitment ends with us being overwhelmed sometimes if we're not careful before the fire is even lit. We're so consumed with doing something huge for God that we don't do anything for God. Pastor John Ortberg in his book called I'd Like You More If You Were More Like Me, great title, tells about a time when someone asked the late professor Dallas Willard a question. If a person wants to grow spiritually, where should they start? Read the Bible, pray more, go to church? I love what Dallas Willard says in response to that question. 
Dallas said, do the next right thing you know you ought to do. Now, when you try that, you may wind up going to church because you're going to need some help. Nothing will drive you into the kingdom of God like trying to do the next thing that is right because that is where God is. Godly grit is living life for Christ as a marathon, not a sprint. Godly grit is all about doing the next right thing that you know you ought to do. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Simply, it means doing the next right thing that you know you ought to do. We need the courage to do the next right thing we know we ought to do. For Elisha, the next right thing he knew that he was supposed to do was burning the plow equipment, killing the oxen in a bold proclamation, and following Elijah. That's all in commitment to God, doing the next right thing that you know you ought to do. For us, doing the next right thing that we know we ought to do could be any number of things. What's the next right thing that we ought to do? It might mean reading our Bible more and praying, yes. It could mean asking your spouse or your parents or your children for forgiveness. It may mean practicing some kinder, gentler driving techniques on the 101. It could mean telling a neighbor about Jesus Christ or a coworker about the hope you have in Christ. It might mean cultivating patience and kindness with a difficult person in your life. If it's possibly it's getting help for an addiction that you cannot make go away on your own. It might mean giving your time and your talents and your money in serving the Lord. It means listening to one another across racial divides. It means loving those who are deeply hurting in our country right now. It means repenting of our own racism or our racist tendencies that might be there. It means grieving with those who grieve, falling on our knees and praying for an end to racism in this country. That's the next right thing that we ought to do at this moment in history. Doing the next right thing always means making choices and acting in ways that line up completely with God's word, character, and truth. When you wake up in the morning, begin by asking God, what's the next right thing that you want me to do? That's a gritty prayer. Say, Lord, I know you're up to something in the world and I want to be a part of it, so what is it? And then do it. Godly grit is a commitment to do the next right thing that we know we ought to do. As you know, I pastored a church in Zurich, Switzerland for about seven years. The Swiss are masters at making tunnels. The mountains of Switzerland are literally like Swiss cheese, full of tunnels. My friend Andy is a Swiss architect. I asked him once about the tunnels and I got a lesson in Swiss tunnel engineering. The tunnels have these elaborate drainage and ventilation systems, but the tunnels also always have a very distinctive curve at either end. You can never see all the way through a Swiss tunnel. Part of that is for military reasons. During the Cold War, the Swiss made the entire country into a fortress. You never want your enemies to have a clean shot at you through the tunnel. Part of it is because people who are claustrophobic won't enter a long tunnel if they know just how long it is, if they can see all the way to the other end. But as followers of Christ, we know what lies at the end of the tunnel, yes. But in God's mercy, he doesn't show us every single step in the journey. If he did, we probably wouldn't have the courage to step into life. God wants us to place one foot in front of the other. God calls us to do the next right thing we know we ought to do. We do that knowing that God has us, that God loves us, that God cares for us, that God died on the cross for us and rose from the dead for us. But that's following Christ. In our world, obsessed 
with immediate gratification, I really appreciate Eugene Peterson's prescription for discipleship. Following Jesus, Peterson says, is a long obedience in the same direction. Godly grit is a commitment to do the next right thing we know we ought to do. That is radical discipleship. That's burning our yoke, killing our oxen, and following Jesus. Godly grit is a commitment to do the next right thing we know we ought to do. Doing the next right thing we know we ought to do is sometimes possible on our own strength. Sometimes it just takes that grit and determination and discipline and accountability and willpower, and sometimes we get it right. But the beauty in doing the next right thing we know we ought to do is the fact that there are many times in life when we can't do the next right thing we know we ought to do. We will fall and fail big time and often. That's the whole point. We're unable to do the next right thing consistently without our Savior, Jesus Christ. Daily striving and often failing to do the next right thing we know we ought to do points us into the arms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, where we find love and grace and forgiveness through the cross. May we grow in worship, in knowledge of God's word, in love, in service, in humility, in joy, and in godly grit as we place one foot in front of the other, walking daily in a long obedience in the same direction. As we conclude our worship this morning and enter into the beauty of summer, I hope that you take a few extra moments to think and pray about what it is that God is calling you to at this moment. I ask that that God would show you in every situation what is the next right thing that you know you ought to do and that you would have the courage to step into that. It's my prayer that we at El Montecito Presbyterian Church would consistently do the next right thing that we know we ought to do for God's glory and God's renown. May we wake up every morning excited about what God is doing and about being a part of what God is doing. That is godly grit. And I pray that we have an added measure of that grit as we continue to honor God with our lives. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we want to be a part of the work that you are doing in this world. Give us strength to do the next right thing we know we ought to do in following you. And give us the courage to be bold in our love, radical in our forgiveness, and always willing to follow you. Heal our land. Bring your peace which passes all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.